Hello, my name is Terry Lowe, and I'm the CEO of VizGen. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Already this year, we've seen some really exciting news about spatial genomics, and we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing at VizGen to help advance the field as well. So I'm going to split up this presentation into three parts. The first part is a little bit of background on our company and some of our considerations and perspectives on how we think about developing product in the field of spatial genomics. Next, I'll talk about the MERSCOPE platform, which we've just recently developed and how that fits into the framework that we had just discussed. And finally, I'm going to share a very special project that we've been working on internally uh, and some of the data that we have generated from that project. First, let me tell you a little bit about the company. VizGen is a company that's fully dedicated towards delivering the best tools for spatial genomics, as we believe that this will have a profound effect on enabling discoveries that are going to advance human life. We are based in Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're actually a spin out from Harvard University, as the core technology the company was founded on, called MERFISH, was developed in Xiaowei Zhuang's lab at Harvard. And Vision has a commercial license to the IP for that technology, which means that Vision is the only company that can develop and sell products utilizing Murfish. Let's take a step back and see how genomics has been evolving as a technology over the past decade or so. The overarching goal for genomics, and really any technology in the life sciences, is to interrogate the complexity of biological systems so that we can design better diagnostics, better therapeutics, and better vaccines. The challenge has been matching the technology with the biology. With bulk sequencing, we've had the capability of sequencing and identifying genes from pretty much any organism or any sample, which is an incredibly powerful tool. However, because our bodies are made up of trillions of cells, many of which are at different cell types or going to be at different cell states, this still leaves us with a significant gap in our understanding of biology. This is why single cell sequencing was such an important advancement in the evolution of genomics. However, single cell sequencing also requires that you disassociate the cells from their natural tissue state. And so you lose that spatial organization that's very important in understanding how a biological system works. And this is why spatial genomics is so powerful, because now we can retain that organization and we can understand how at a single cell molecular level, those cells can interact and function within a tissue. The importance of spatial organization and spatial context is pretty easy to appreciate when you're at a macro level. For example, if I were to say, hey, come meet me at my office in Cambridge, you might say, okay, could you please send me some more information? And if this is the information I sent, which is all disaggregated and out of context, you probably wouldn't be too happy. And if you did try to use this information to find the office, you'd probably go the wrong way. And this is exactly how biological systems are set up. They have a defined organizational structure which is what's necessary for us to really understand how the components within it are able to function. And this is why spatial genomics plays such a critical role in this understanding. One of the things that's been particularly exciting about spatial genomics is just how fast the field has been advancing. In fact, in the last few months, we've seen announcements around new technologies and new products that are potentially coming out on the market. And while all of this is very exciting to hear, it can also potentially present certain challenges in trying to make sense of it all. So I thought it might be helpful if I shared a little bit about how we look at spatial genomics platforms and how we evaluate them. So in general, we can bucket things into two major groupings. The first one is data type and data quality. The second grouping would be implementation factors. These factors could be things like pricing or workflow or sample flexibility. Now there's no doubt that these two categories or two groups uh, tend to have some overlap and they also have dependencies on one another. And I think it's also true that both are equally important. If you're a research lab, you want to have both good data and good implementation. 
However, for this presentation today, I am going to focus on the first group, the data type and data quality. And the reason is because I believe that's going to be more universally applicable to the research community, whereas implement, implementation factors tend to be more specific to a particular research lab. And certain research labs may need certain types of implementation factors that may differ from other ones. So what data types and data quality attributes are most important for spatial genomics? Here's a list of what we found to be of the highest priority. First is multiplexing. I think what's clear here is that you do need to target a high number of genes in order to be able to differentiate cell types or cell states. What's a little bit less clear is exactly what that number should be. So I think, at least for now, the best answer to this is what have researchers found to be the most useful? And in our experience, most researchers are tend to look at something in the several hundreds as being the most useful data sets uh, to analyze. Once you start getting too high, it starts to get a bit unwieldy to manage. And in fact, if you start going beyond 1,000, it starts to feel like you're boiling the ocean. The next attribute on the list is resolution. And the question here is, what is the minimum level of resolution that we want to have in a spatial genomics platform? So if we go back to the previous slide where I was showing the evolution of genomics, what's really important, I think, in this case is that we're looking at the biological system. And as we've already discussed, the most important unit within a biological system is going to be the cell. And that also ties back to all of the single cell sequencing data that's being generated. And so I think from a platform standpoint, the minimum resolution that you're going to want to have is going to be at the single cell level. The next one is sensitivity. And we don't mean emotional sensitivity, but rather detection efficiency, meaning for any particular gene that's expressing transcripts, how many of those can be detected by the platform? And this is going to be extremely important when it comes to low and medium expressors that may be biologically relevant and biologically important. But if the sensitivity is low, then the platform may completely miss those. And now we have accuracy, which I think is pretty straightforward. Really, how accurate is the platform? Is it going to be able to identify the gene transcripts correctly, or will it make mistakes? And finally, we have reproducibility. I think this one pretty much speaks for itself. So these are the five areas that we think are going to be the most important when it comes to data and data quality for spatial genomics. But what I also want to highlight here is that these two areas, resolution and sensitivity, these are the two standards that are going to completely change when Merscope comes out on the market. And that's what's going to make spatial genomics data so much more useful and powerful, as we'll see in a minute. And on to MERSCOPE, which is our integrated spatial genomics platform. As I mentioned earlier, we license MERFISH, which is the core technology out of Harvard University. And from that, we've built and designed products, including reagent kits, instrument, and software. So we will be releasing this product with a limited commercial release this summer in the US, which is just a few months away. And then later in the year, we will have the full commercial release. In 2022, that's when we'll have our international release for MERSCO. One of the things we've done very intentionally is to develop our products so that they provide a full solution. This is something that we feel is really important in order to ensure that we maintain the highest data quality and data integrity by having a standardized process all the way through. And so you can see on this slide where we've incorporated different technologies in order to ensure that we do get the best solution. So I'm just going to summarize that quickly here, and then I'm going to walk into a little bit more detail in the following slides. But you can see that we have technologies both on the chemistry side as well as the hardware and software. And we use single molecule fish as our detection approach. We're able to do multiplexing by having a combinatorial barcoding system. We incorporate something called error robustness in our barcoding in order to get the highest level of accuracy. And then on the hardware side, we've developed a fully integrated fluidics and imaging system that's a really turnkey in terms of developing 
the process and the data, which can be then pushed downstream into our software to allow you to visualize and enable you to analyze it. Now let's get into the details on how all of this works. First, we use single molecule fish as our detection method. Single molecule fish has been established as the gold standard for having the highest detection efficiency for any method of detecting RNA. This is done by using a series of probes instead of a single probe with a fluorescent label. The disadvantage, however, of single molecule fish is that it's good for detecting maybe one or two or three gene targets at a time. Now that we're able to achieve the highest sensitivity, how do we get to high multiplexing? Merscope has the capability to simultaneously profile hundreds of genes at a time and potentially up to thousands. In order to do this, we created a barcoding scheme where each targeted gene is assigned a unique binary barcode. This is a sequence of zeros and ones. We then read out the barcode with sequential imaging. When a fluorescent signal is detected, it represents a one. If there is no signal on the molecule, then it's a zero, as you can see in this example here. By performing multiple rounds of imaging, a binary barcode can now be read out. We can match this readout with the original barcode that identifies what the gene transcript should be. This method has actually an added advantage in that it's extremely flexible. So then you can pick your own genes or design your own panel however you want and not be limited by any preset panels. And of course, as we discussed earlier, not only is sensitivity and multiplexing extremely important, but so is accuracy. Murfish's barcoding system actually is designed with something called error robustness. This is the ER in Murfish. The barcode sequences are designed to have enough space between them, so incorrectly assigning a barcode is going to be very unlikely. If there is a readout error, the system can assign the readout to the nearest correct barcode. This is what makes the results of MERSCOPE so accurate and consistent. And as you can see here in this example, where in gene 3, the detected barcode, the last bit is a 1. However, since there is no barcode that has this same code, it will look for the closest one to it, which would be the gene three and correct its barcode in that way. Here you can see the instrument, which is a fully integrated microscopy and fluidic system. On the left, you can see a prepared sample being put into the flow chamber, which is then put into the instrument along with a reagent pack. From there, you just turn on the system and you're good to go. It's fully automated. This imaging platform also has the highest resolution of any spatial platform out there at less than 100 nanometers. It also provides a very large imaging area of up to one centimeter square. So you're getting the best of both worlds where you're able to get a large sample, but at the same time get the highest amount of resolution. So here we can see some examples of how resolution works on the MERSCOPE system. And what's really important here is that we're seeing this at different scales. So you can see the whole section of a mouse brain. And then you can zoom in and you get the wide field of view to be able to see individual cells and how they're neighboring and interacting with each other to understand potentially the function of those individual cells. And you can even get down to the subcellular level where you can look to see where the location of specific RNA transcripts are within the cell itself. And now I want to just show a quick example of how important sensitivity can be to generating the right data for your research. So here we have two matched brain sections and on the top we're showing VisGen's MERSCOPE. On the bottom is the array-based platform that uses 55 micron spot size. So if we were to look at a single gene, and in this case, it's an opioid receptor gene, this is what we would see. On the VisGen side, you can clearly see all of the cells that are expressing this particular gene, and you can start to see the organizational structure of those cells actually within the section. However, on the array-based platform example, you barely see any spots there, and you would probably incorrectly conclude that there's not much present there in terms of cells expressing this gene. 
And in fact, when we looked at the total amount of transcripts that were ex expressed for the entire gene panel, we found that there were 70 times more transcripts per gene detected by MERSCOPE than the array-based platform. And earlier we talked about the two areas where the standards of data would change dramatically when MERSCOPE came out, and those were the areas of sensitivity and resolution. So I thought I'd do another quick example comparing the two platforms, but this time looking at resolution. So when we zoom in with the MERSCOPE platform, what we can clearly see are all the individual cells, including those cells that are expressing the gene that are shown here in green. However, when we use the array-based platform and zoom in, and assuming that there was something that was detected, we would probably see something like this, where you see these 55 micron spots, but within the spots, you actually just see the average expression that's there. What's also striking, I think, in this picture is that all of the dead area outside the spots where there's absolutely no information at all. So once again, I think the key takeaway here is that the ability to get to at least single cell information and to capture the information in that cell is of critical importance. And so now into the last section, and this is something that we're really excited to announce, which is a program where we're going to have a series of data being released off of our MERSCOPE instrument. And the first set of data has just been released, which is a mouse receptor map. And I'll show you some of that data here. So we took the mouse brain and we took three different coronal sections of a mouse brain and took replicates from multiple mice so that we had three replicates of three sections totaling nine sections. And we made a panel of nearly 500 genes, which includes mainly receptor genes, as well as a number of canonical markers. And you can start to see here, as we're showing some of the individual gene expression, some of the interesting organizational patterns within the brain. And the theme of this talk has really been around data quality. And so as you might expect, we ran a number of experiments to rigorously test the quality of this data set. And as you can see here, we did a correlation with bulk sequencing. And in every case, all of the sections had a R value of around 0.87, which is really, really good. And then moving on to reproducibility testing, we compared the different replicates against each other. So in this case, we were showing 1A versus 1B and 1A versus 1C and 1B versus 1C. And as you can see, in all cases, we came out with a R value of 0.98 to 0.99. And what's really been novel about this is now that for the first time, we really have the ability to interlace the spatial genomics with single cell. And so here you can see both the spatial mapping as well as a new map of the cell clusters. And just one more example from this data set, we did a pretty straightforward and simple analysis where we did uh, an analysis of the cortex and we were, because we can get it to a single cell and analyze the individual cell types that are there, we split it apart into neuron and non-neuronal cells. So now that we have those split out into these two different cell types of neuron and non-neuronal cells, here we're showing an example of a GPRC5B gene expression across the cortex. And you can see if you look at it in totality, you get one sort of expression profile across the cortex. Looks very different in terms of where the neurons are expressing this gene in the cortex versus the non-neuronal cells. And here again, we're expanding it a little bit by showing a few other gene examples, once again, categorizing it by neuronal and non-neuronal cell types. And this really is what we wanna to show to hopefully get some interest uh, from all of you in terms of potentially looking at this data set. And you know, we wanna make this publicly available so that people can start to play around with the data and do their own analysis. And if you are interested, 
I encourage you to please reach out and contact us and we can definitely get you hooked up with the data. There is some contact information at the end of this presentation which you can reach us at. And so in conclusion, I wanted to again show the list of the five areas where we've really prioritized and what we've thought is important from a spatial genomics platform in terms of data and data quality. And these are all areas that we've really focused on for MERScope to ensure that we're getting the highest performance in each of these areas. And once again, with resolution and sensitivity, these are really two areas that I think are going to be game changing to enable spatial genomics to become really more valuable as a, as a platform. And for most of you who have followed this field quite closely, I'm sure a lot of this is not new to you since over the last five or six years, MRFISH has been really well established as a leading technology in terms of the type of data and data quality that's generated. And this has been shown over a number of publications over the past years, as well as a number of leading institutions who have started to bring MRFISH in on their own independently. And the theme of this presentation and focus has really been around data type and data quality. But I don't want you to walk away thinking that implementation factors are not something that are important to VisGen or to the development of MERScope. In fact, it's quite the opposite, as our objective and mission really has been to take the MERFISH technology and make it into a product that can be easily adopted and implemented by laboratories all over the world. And so that really is our goal. And what we've really focused on over the past year and a half is to make it as easy and simple to use as possible. I just didn't want to pack all that in into one presentation. So that will be a presentation for another day or certainly reach out to us and we can provide you all of that information. And to wrap up, I just want to thank you for attending this presentation. This is going to be such an incredibly exciting year for spatial genomics and all of us at VisGen, we're just thrilled to be able to participate and bring our platform out into the field and hopefully accelerate some of the great data and research that's being generated. Here's our contact information. If you are interested in the data release program, if you're interested in the platform, or if you're interested in our lab services, please just feel free to contact us via the email address. And once again, the Platform release is coming in the summer of this year in the US, but it will be a limited release. So we're also maintaining a wait list. So if you're interested in that, we can keep your place in line as well. So thank you again and hope everyone will be safe and take care.